The goal of this podcast is to help you break in and thrive in advertising and marketing. Or at the very least, learn a little something about this crazy industry we all love. This week, we have another marketing legend, Mark Ritson, an award-winning professor at institutions like the London Business School, SMU, and a shabby little school called MIT. He paired that time in academia with a career as a global brand consultant, working on brands like Johnson & Johnson, Dom Perignon, Hennessy, Louis Vuitton, just to name a few. And because all of that wasn't enough, and I didn't even touch on his time as a columnist, he now runs the mini MBA programs at Marketing Week. In this episode, we spend an hour attempting to tame some of the craziness within the marketing zoo, discuss the shortcomings of American marketing, and break down some of the theories and concepts you often hear flung across LinkedIn. His message is clear. Let's get back to the basics. And his mini MBA in marketing is a great place to start for anyone, those who are unsure of the basics or those who just need a quick refresher. I've taken it and it was a blast and it was a great way to round out some of my fundamental skills. I'm Cooper Colvig and this week I'll be your host. As always, kick it, Mikey. Mark, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Good to be here, Cooper. Greetings from Australia, where I should point out it is uh, Wednesday. So, yeah, whole day ahead from Chicago. We're so much further ahead, especially from the Midwest. So the good news is if anyone's worried about the world ending, I can confirm at least for another day that we're still here. <laughs> <laughs> is it, would that explain why, why you're ahead in, in marketing as well? It is a big advantage, Coop. I've, I've got to be honest with you. Just being able to have that extra 24 hours of, of, <laughs> of perspective puts me ahead of all the, the North Americans, obviously, <laughs> right? who are behind. Uh, then I need to relocate. And uh, we can dig into that a little bit more later, too. But uh, we always start the show off with our guests breaking and entering story. We hear uh, a lot of different things. You know, people talk about wanting, being drawn towards the, the creative side of, of business or that they happen to just fall into it. Um, and, and hearing you speak before, you know, you found it and immediately fell in love with it. And I'd uh, love to hear how that story went for you. Yeah. It, it's almost the opposite of the guys that fall into it in the sense that it was such a desire of mine almost, well, yeah, from adult, from the onset of adult life that I can't even explain to you it's like sexuality or something i can't explain it to you because it's kind of always been there you know what i mean i, I do recall the, the moment it probably happened for me was i was waiting over the summer to go to university and i'd been scheduled to go and become a um an undergraduate uh, english student uh and i discovered late in the application process that the university i was applying to lancaster actually had the oldest and most venerated marketing degree in the UK. And so I kind of spent the rest of the summer badgering people in the department to let me switch across, which they eventually did. And I'm still friends with Stuart Riley, who was then the sort of senior lecturer in charge of admissions. And this is long before email, right? So I'm ringing his office kind of every third day, making the case for me to be switched across because I was convinced that that was the thing for me. And, and, and it was, I got in, I studied marketing, I worked in marketing a little, I went back, did my PhD, you know, it was always the thing. And I guess the only other point to add, and I think this is a point of difference with, with many academics, which is how I started, is I really became ultimately a marketing professor because I really loved marketing. Um, I didn't become a marketing professor because I really loved the idea of being a professor. And particularly in the States, I found that was a, a quite a, quite a differentiator. That's yeah, that's incredible. And I, I feel the same way. Um, and something that, you know, even for me and, and why I love even getting to do this podcast is as I've delved deeper into the industry and talked with more folks and, and asked more questions, I found that it's a complete mess, that there is stuff flying all over the place, shit everywhere. Yeah. Um, 
so it's fun trying to to unravel that and excited to do that with you today. Yeah, no, you're right. And and I think the other the other addition to that is we certainly when I was a young marketer, you went to America to to unravel it, right? That to, there were people out there that kind of knew what was going on, the Arkers and the Kellers. And and um but that was 30 years ago. And now if you go to America, you get more confused than anywhere about what the hell's going on. I, you know, it's not, it's not straightening out marketing. It's doing, it's making it more curly, you know? So I think that also adds to the problem, you know, that we don't have the great lights that shone out of business schools kind of lighting the way now in, in America. And uh, genuinely, I miss, I miss that because that was, that was an important marketing was invented in America in the big farm schools in the Midwest. You know, that's where it began with Roe Alderson and, and, and there was unfortunately all white men who went to study marketing pre and post World War II. And then it's sort of gone in the, it, it, even in the last 15, 20 years, it's sort of gone a bit silent and we've lost out to the Gary V's of the world, which I think is uh, to the industry's detriment, you know? So why do you think that is? Ah, uh, look, there's a couple of things. Um, Certainly the universities are partly at fault. So you can't ha keep hiring people who are 22 from uh, grad school and make them professors of marketing without them doing any marketing. It's horseshit. I don't care what they say. Like my dad, who's a very simple man, was always obsessed when I was teaching in America about the fact that everyone I was teaching with had not actually done any of the work. I I'd never worked in marketing or were doing any marketing work. And that's true of most places. So Gradually, the university system folded in on itself and became academic with a small a. You know what I mean? Like it, it, you, you have to do the work one way or another to teach marketing. It's as simple as that. Um, on the other side, the channels of communication sped up. So you've got to remember, if you're a marketing professor, you need to, you know, and you do a big, a big new study proving that, I don't know, podcasts are insanely good at brand building. That would be a terrible paper. But let's say I've got <laughs> this, I've got this desire to prove this in 2023. It's going to take me a year to collect the data, a year to write the paper, and then at least a year, probably two, to get it published and into press. Right? So there's a three right. to four year lead time from idea to sharing it. And of course, in the rest of the world, as we know, there's a three second lead time from thinking, you know what, I think that direct marketing is the future and I can have it out among my followers very quickly. And there really isn't a correlation between the number of followers everybody has and the amount of wisdom owned by different people, right? And I'm as guilty of that as anyone else. And so therefore, we democratize knowledge, which was great, but also bad. Interesting. With that kind of being the case, there are some of these long-standing rules that, as you like to say, like taken with a grain of salt or at other times um, don't believe in at all, but we'll use um, Peter Field and Lisbon, that's like 60-40 as, mm -hmm. as an example, right? It's obviously not always going to be 60-40 and there are different numbers that kind of sway depending on maturation of a brand and obviously all the, all the different variables that come to play. But as you kind of map how long it takes to get a study like that, that things have changed much quicker while that's going on. But in the case of maybe like 60, 40, where it's super rudimentary and strong, simple, and you can use that, that thinking to kind of guide your way. Uh, a lot of times there's, we're seeing that people aren't even digesting that once it's even out. No, I mean, look, if you look at the two great books of modern marketing, and I'm certainly not forgetting about the ones that preceded them, but there's really only two, right? There's, there's Field and Burnett's monograph, really, the long and the short of it, which builds on their earlier work. And, and then there's a couple that follow it from them. And then you've got Ehrenberg, Bass and Byron Sharp and How Brands Grow. And both of them are 10 years old. Both of them are classical in the sense that what they're saying isn't going to change in 10 or even 50 years. But as you say, it's very dangerous because you and I can have a long old chat about Field and Burnett, ignorant of the fact that, you know, 90% of marketers have no idea who, that could be a country and Western duo. Do you know what I mean? So w what we have is an absence of foundational knowledge, which to some degree holds the whole of marketing back. And, and I don't think that's got better. I think it's probably got worse in recent years. 
So does that fall back on the universities and and the schools in the U.S. for not taking some of those foundational elements and teaching I think them? There's, a, there's an element of that, right? Field Bennett and even Byron Sharp aren't really true academics in the... I mean, I don't want to give them anything other than lots of credit, but none of them are working in top-tier universities publishing top-tier research. I mean, Sharp is doing his own thing with Ehrenberg Bass, and much to his credit. Field and Bennett don't have advanced degrees. So they don't fit into the system. And therefore, that paradigm, we know from the philosophies of science that we'll have to wait for a whole generation with existing knowledge systems to literally die out in marketing academia before new PhDs come through that have may, maybe absorbed their work. But I think there's a bigger point here, Ka Cooper, because they, they, we're not going to see a bunch of marketers going through marketing degrees and coming out ready for their careers. Um, we have to be you know, formal and informal training has to be bigger than the university system, particularly again, when in, in many places, UK and US, it's so expensive now that I, I, I understand why people don't formally want to study for a degree, right? So yeah, I think we have to be more broad. The, but the point I would make, the most important point is I don't care. You know, I talk about it and people always say, you know, but what are we going to do about this? And I'm like, I don't care. If anything, I think it's a really, a really rather advantageous situation. You know, there's a playbook of fantastically applicable knowledge that makes you and your brand more effective. And only 10% of marketers have read it. Well, what do you want to do about that? I don't want the other 90% to know about it. I mean, I'm not going to stop them learning about it if they ask me. But at the same time, let's just, you know... Marketing isn't a team sport, right? It's meant to be competitive. Let's enjoy that and continue to smash the ignorant, you know, not physically, but in the commercial world. That's a great thing, right? I mean, it's like doing consulting for P&G. It sucks because they're 50, 60, 70% smarter than your average marketing organization. You've got to work so much harder, right? I don't want to do that every day. I want to work for wonderful, smart, but fundamentally ignorant companies where the low hanging fruit can be revelatory. So yeah, no, let's let's not fix it too quickly though, Cooper. Let's keep it, you know, let's keep it between friends. And if anyone wants to learn, we'll certainly, you know, help them. But let's encourage the ignorant and unwashed to continue that way because this is, you know, we aren't curing cancer here. This is a competitive <laughs> thing. That point, how has it even become more confused when you have folks who kind of sway the far other side where a lot of what's being talked about is kind of utter utter garbage or isn't taken with a grain of salt where we're dealing in absolutes that creative is the way strategy is rooted in data and numbers or um, it none of it matters if if you're not in the right medium etc it's part of it so there's an ignorance point and then this point you're raising now is this almost childlike inability to multitask in a mental way, right? If you think everyone's been to a conference, and you know, panel sessions for me are the ultimate and total lack of fucking point, right? So you set up a, I specifically have a clause in any conference I ever go to that I will not take part in a panel, right? Because they're just always pointless. They're just a reach around, you know? And the other problem with panels is they set up this kind of, you know, the classic shit panel, which every conference does is, uh, is it about your gut or is it about data or data versus creativity? <laughs> and it's like, okay, let me do this one. Let me do this one. It's both. Thank you. Let's move on to session two, right? But that's how the marketing model works, right? We, uh, I mean, I wrote about it this week. Pan is on a massive, massive boner for everything to do with creativity. Everything's creativity and, of course, D D E I, you know, uh, equality and th those things and AI are all, uh, that's where we're at, right? And they're all wonderfully important things, but not at the expense of all the other things we're not talking about. And, you know, 10 years ago, we were obsessed with media and we forgot about creativity and what we put in the media pipe was as important as the pipe. Now we're swinging the other way and it's all oh, creativity is the only thing you need. It's like, no, no, turns out, no, that's not true. Yeah, you need strategy to set it up. You need media to carry it. And as we know from the great work of Paul Dyson, and this is not a popular stat in America, the single biggest driver of advertising effectiveness 
is how big you already are as a brand. Yeah. Campbell's Soup can do the world's worst advertising and not spend any more than the, you know, tiny soup company, but their very size, mental share of, of mind and physical share of shelf mean that they'll always get a shit ton more value from their advertising because they're pre-existingly big. Yeah. All those factors need to be added into the mix. Where you have it broken down into uh, quarters too, where you have your, your strategy, creative media, and, and then obviously the brand size is playing a role. In yeah. It. I mean, I did, that's what I did in my column. That's right. It was, I was slightly taking the piss, right? Cause I'm just making up the numbers. They're all 25%. And it was great. Cause I, I yeah, I weighted them all equally. Cause I'm like, fuck it. Who cares? It's all bullshit <laughs> anyway. Right. And then someone emailed me and went, oh, I think brand should be higher. And I'm like, I disagree. And I have more made up data that I can use against you in this argument. Do you know what I mean? But yeah, in, in a general sense, I mean, I think that's one of the beauties of the 60-40 rule is it is very basic. And it does, you know, it's a mental model. So I think remembering that there's lots of factors. They don't have to be perfect. And they're crucially, they're multiplicative. You, you can't have the world's greatest creative tactics making up for a shit strategy because two times two will always be more than zero times three. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, so to what extent do you believe that the kind of fractional system the marketing world has become has kind of left us speaking different languages? If I'm, if I'm uh, a marketing major or a brand management major, or uh, aspiring strategists, and, and I'm looking at the world and I'm seeing that you have creative agencies and you have in-house, and then you have these guys who are in the middle about media and they're all saying similar things with the same words and arguing about whether a brand is this or that. Where do you start? I mean, you start with the work, right? So I think a, a big problem with the, the zoo of marketing is we're all talking about the philosophy of it all. And really it comes down to the work and how it's done, right? And that means ultimately that as much as agencies are important, they're all at the behest of the client. And so you start with a client that basically knows what the fuck she's doing. Yeah. If we've got that, we have a chance of everything else working. Because no matter how good the agency is, if the client is wrapped up in politically correct, obtuse, incorrect marketing thinking, it doesn't matter what they do, it's all going to go horribly wrong. Right. So what we want is, not no genius, but a decent marketer with a bit of experience steeped in the fundamentals of marketing that knows how to build a marketing plan and knows how to brief it into a decent agency. And if we've got that, eight times out of 10, we're going to be okay. So are there any things that you're seeing as far as the, the U.S. market making any sort of progress within the marketing no, and no, advertising? No, it's, it's still getting a lot worse. So one of the big problems for, and, and again, let me preface this by saying I love America and I love Americans. I spent about 10 years there. I, if, you, if it wasn't for an Australian wife, I'd still be living in the States. I love the place, right? It's great. So I'm not your usual wanker European Australian who hates the States, but I love America. I love everything about it, right? But with that caveat, um, there's a lot of problems. Now, one of them is the ignorance thing we talked about earlier, but another big one is we're moving towards, at least for brand building, I think a general recognition now that Ehrenberg Bass are correct and that you, if you can with your budget, you want to build your brand to everyone in the category, every potential buyer. That segmenting and targeting like we all did in the 90s and noughties, at least when it comes to the initial top of funnel brand building, doesn't make sense. If you've got the budget, you want to target everyone. And I, I, I think very few things are inarguable in marketing, but that point is. That takes us to a problem in America because, as we have many case studies to demonstrate, targeting the mass when the mass is opposed to itself is in itself a very difficult thing. I mean, the obvious example is Bud Light. There are obviously others too. But how do you go out to all beer drinkers with a message when within that group, there are literally factions that think the other faction is trying to kill them yeah, or ruin their way of life? You know what I mean? We don't have that problem in other cultures. We certainly have some polarization, but the, the hyper-polarization of American culture is horrible for a number of reasons. But 
from a marketing point of view, it really makes mass marketing very difficult right now. And I'm not sure how we get around that. It appears it, it's certainly accelerating, right? Which even to what you talk a lot about in the, the mini MBA, that switching, you know, all cylinders towards um, highly focused um, segments and sub-segments can't necessarily be the answer either. You want a bit of both, but if you're going to have a cohesive and, and integrated message across your different tactics, it has to make it far more complex to take any sort of side, which I could only imagine begins to suck a level of creative oxygen out of the room once you've gotten to the execution phase of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's that. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, I don't care, right? Let, let's insult people, not intendedly, but let's tell the truth. The marketing operations of most brands swing heavily left, right? I have no political bias of any, I don't give a shit. Right? I've never voted in my life, don't care. Um, but if you look at most, not all, but most marketing operations, they swing significantly further left than the marketplace that they're serving or elements of that marketplace, right? And, and therefore what we get is this attempt to educate, convert, evolve, advance society through marketing, which is inappropriate in my opinion. Not because we shouldn't evolve society, but, but because we have to do it with deference to those that pay for the brand. And if you look at the Bud Light crisis and what it comes down to, and, and the well-meaning but unfortunate brand manager responsible, she, she literally didn't have any time for existing customers of that brand. She was all about the customers. It did. That's, that was the Achilles heel in what was otherwise a well-intended strategy, was don't forget about the people you've already got. They're not the enemy. They're the ones paying for everything. So once we politicize it like that, that's where the anger comes from. That's where the boycotts come from. And, it, and you're right. That's where the creativity now, if you look at the response, I'm not sure this was a pastiche or not, but apparently Bud Light were then offering, there was a competition to win a semi-automatic rifle a couple of weeks later. Now, I don't know anymore what's real and what's not real, but it's, it's highly possible that is real. And you get this bifurcation going on, you know, let's have a transsexual spokesperson Let's have a raffle for a, for a machine gun. And that's the attempt to balance something that cannot be balanced, you know? So I think that's an, an intractable problem for big American brands right now. And the smart ones are staying out of it and are focusing on high level emotional benefits of the brand, but not overstepping the mark and getting involved in the culture wars, because ultimately you, you will, either way, you will lose. Yeah, that's that's incredibly interesting um, and kind of a wild way to break down exactly what it feels is is happening, where even when when I was in school, I feel like culture, culture, cultural insights, that's that's all that was was discussed before even a lot of the um, like self-taught um, work that I've done around. Uh, Byron Sharp and and his books and and even getting into Mark Pollard and and now even taking the the mini MBA that uh, this kind of rolls back to your earlier point that we're now so far away from the basics and the fundamentals. Yeah, the fa the foundations could save us though, Cuba, in the sense that as we've covered in mini MBA, there's a difference between talking about product features and getting to emotional brand benefits and then climbing out into the sky and trying to fix society, yeah? And what often happens in this debate is if the Ehrenberg Bass stuff, the Byron Sharp stuff, in my opinion, is still too shallow and still too product-based and too superficial and too much about distinctiveness only, you know, empty differentiation. And the cultural stuff that comes out of the United States is too highfalutin, it's too uh, anthropological, it's too high culture, it's, it's trying to fix things, right? In the middle is the sweet spot, which is we can talk about benefits of a brand that aren't going to piss anyone off, irrespective of their orientations, that are rooted in the in why we buy and consume brands, but aren't you know aren't the basics either. I mean, in the UK, for example, the IPA winner last year, sort of the Effie winner last year, was Cadbury's Chocolate, who have a brand purpose of generosity 
which is built around the idea that there's more milk in Cadbury than there is in the competitors, which there is. And it does make for a more generous, uh, more uh, milky, more enjoyable chocolate. But also, therefore, one step up from that, there's a feeling when you give Cadbury or you consume Cadbury, you're being generous to yourself or to someone else. And that's the platform they built. Now, whether you're a transsexual or a a fervent uh, lover of armaments, there ain't nothing in there that's going to cause a problem. Yeah, as long as we keep it at that baseline. And what's more, we're not just keeping it at that baseline because we're avoiding that debate. It's because the debate isn't to do with our brands anyway. You know what I mean? They don't benefit from being in that area anyway. Now, there are a couple of brands where you're drawn into that, and then you have to walk that tightrope. I get that. But most brands have no, you know, they have no need to get involved in that nonsense. What they need to do is concentrate on the, the job at hand, which is, my yogurt is better than the other yogurts, and also it makes you feel X. You know what I mean? That's the job, man. Get back to the work. Yeah, you've lost lost the 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 line in in the middle, and even like endangering the the a brand for the sake of of a societal change. When really, at the end of the day, what Bud Light's trying to do is is sell more beer. It's almost like oh, what had to have been seven or eight years ago when you had the the Pepsi, the Kendall Jenner Pepsi ad where it, instead of the the flower where you've just become i guess it, what seems to be so detached from what the goals and objectives really should have been yeah. at the beginning well, and what happens in these teams is they spend their time in can like environments right they hang out with each other they don't listen to customers particularly qualitatively if you want to get straightened out right you get your ass down to a greyhound station you know, or a 7-Eleven, and you watch people consuming your product, it takes about an hour to go, oh, hang on, nobody gives a fuck, yeah? It's it's super obvious. What's missing there is is the market orientation of realizing, you know, Bob often has this great line about opening the refrigerator and looking at all the products inside your refrigerator and then working on how many of them you purchased because of their political stand, brand purpose, or anything else. And the answer is zero, right? The truth is in everyone's refrigerator. We are embarrassed just to make good products and sell them and employ people and give people decent yogurt. It's not enough anymore for an elite group of marketers who, for some reason in the last 10 years, want to want to go to a dinner party in Manhattan or Southwest London and say they do more than just sell beer, coffee, yogurt. And I don't suffer from that uh, problem. I, 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 I take great pride in working for great brands who make amazing products, employ lots of very happy people, and make products that delight everyone. I think that's a lovely thing to be involved in. And by the way, there's no reason any of that needs to be at the cost of the planet, needs to be at the cost of, of animals, needs to be at the cost of, of equality. It, it, a good business will 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 do those things by, by its own right and not necessarily crow about it either because it's not relevant when you're making yogurt just look after your cows you'll get better you'll get better yogurt as a result don't go on about it to consumers unless they want you to go on about it right so i think that's for me that's been the big problem and the other thing i've banged on about for about 10 years and no one's ever understood is that the purpose of purpose is purpose right so, okay, if, if a Bud Light, an AB InBev, your purpose really is to establish a more advanced, progressive society, good for you. Don't expect to sell more fucking beer because of it. Expect to sell a bit less, but that's okay because your purpose is the reason you're doing it. What I object to strongly are companies who have made this childish uh, gambit, which is, if we have a brand purpose, we will sell more products to more people at a higher price. That's, that may happen, but it's highly likely that it won't happen, and that's okay. Because if the reason you're doing this is because of an inherent purpose, that's justification enough. And there are good examples. I mean, we always talk about Patagonia. Um, they make a shitty um, surf suit, right? They say it's shitty because it's made from materials that the better swimsuits make from non-ecological material, right? That's, that's a purpose. You know, they tell people on Black Friday not to buy their clothes. Yeah. That's going to cost them money. Do you know what I mean? There was a, a really interesting 
uh, case with the Guardian newspaper in the UK and also in Australia, they've opted not to take any more gambling money. Uh, uh, what's interesting about that isn't the move itself, but when the CCO or whoever it was announced it, she was very clear that this is going to cost us millions of pounds, right? It wasn't like, and by doing this, we will grow our brand. It was like, this will. The, the, there's more gambling money out there than anything else, and we're going to say no to it. It's going to cost us a lot of money, but we choose not to take it. And even when she announced it, and I posted it and said, this is proper purpose, there were loads of marketers saying, yeah, but they'll get more subscriptions and they'll get more other advertising. And I'm like, first of all, no, they won't. Look at what you just said. And second, that's not the point here. There isn't an ROI for purpose. The, the point of purpose is the ROI isn't relevant anymore. Whether it goes up or down, we did it because of the purpose. And I struggle to understand why my colleagues in marketing don't get that point. You know what I mean? If you're going to call it a societal purpose, own it, accept that it may not make you money in the short or long term. And suddenly everything now makes a lot more sense. You know what I mean? But maybe Bud Light isn't screwing things up because it's made a very important statement that many people would agree with, but it's also sold less beer. But was it purpose that was driving that? Or did you intend to sell more beer? Because those two things are not the same thing. Right. Targeting a group in a specific way. Uh, for, for the purpose can, can be great in doing that, but you're going to lose out on the other side if we're on this, these two polarized, polarized group in that way. But to your point, if we've, if we've lost sight of, you know, where, what purpose is, um, and why we're making decisions for, or if we're making decisions based on monetary goals. Does the, is this attributed to this idea that a lot of marketers have have lost their seat at, in the boardroom or or in the C-suite to to really to to speak in in the right way or did, were marketers ever there and we lost it? Look, it, it's always been variable, right? It, it, I can't tell you we've always had a marketer at the boardroom level in every company, and now it's declining. It, it, it's there are companies like the Azure, like PNG where the CMO or CBO, or whatever they're called, is one of the key four or five executives. And there's lots of other companies throughout history where they haven't even had a chief marketing role or it's not really a C role, right? It, it's called C, but it's not really. I don't think it's got better or worse. I think what I could say is you can see the good CMOs that properly occupy a, a, an executive position because they don't focus on advertising, they focus on consumers. So in my limited, but not so limited exposure to senior decision-making, what I've seen throughout my career is no one knows anything about consumers, like fucking nothing, right? They know about sales, they know about margin, they know about product, they know about tax. Oh, yeah. But paradoxically, the one thing they don't know about is the source of everything, which is their, you know, their money and where it comes from. Follow the money, it comes from consumers. And so when you see a strong CMO that's earned her or his place, they haven't gone, oh, I'm in charge of the comms here. They've gone, I'm the touchstone for the consumer. You've got a question about consumers, I'm here. Scott Galloway made a great point about it. During um, COVID, the shit CMOs all went off and made horrible ads with tinkling pianos and women looking out of windows looking concerned. And the good ones sat on the board and went, right, this is what our consumer is currently thinking. This is where they're going. You know, this is what they're doing now. This is how it's changing. But as you saw during COVID, there was, you know, I don't know what the number is, 5% of, of senior marketers were doing that. The other 95% were either doing nothing or they were making crap ads. You know what I mean? And it was, it was a great pleasure. I watched P&G were just phenomenal during COVID partly because their products were useful, but also because this is their, you know, 25th major global crisis. They have literally have a playbook and they're like, okay, here we go again, guys. This is what we do. Here's our strategy. Get, get to page 72. Let's go. They were just supreme leaders. Don Moller, who was at the time the CFO, was the best marketing uh, voice in America, right? And this was a CFO. You know, we missed, we missed all of that. And I think part of it is if you look at that soft, mushy leadership crap about leadership is empathy and all that wank. 
it's really not, man. It, I mean, it is on LinkedIn and it is, it is at some presentation. Leadership is making a call, not necessarily the right call, and that everyone follows you, right? And what we saw with COVID is loads of empathy, but brands just treading water without a clue what the hell they were supposed to do, with a few exceptions who were like, right, here's what we're going to do. This, 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 and this. And, and for me, I think that's what a great CMO should be doing. They're the touchstone for the consumer, right? They're not just involved in comms which is, you know, 8% of our marketing challenge. They're a CMO, not a chief advertising officer. They're involved in pricing and product development, targeting, avoiding these culture wars, letting, letting the rest of the leaders know this is how our customer is thinking. And we just don't have enough of those advanced human beings in those roles, you know? Yeah, it feels often that you're selling the the value of consumer research to to leaders on on the client side or or even to other agencies because and this can just be from from my perspective but that like you you're not getting something tangible out of it you're not seeing something go out into the world from from those roles and it's been uh an increasingly like harder battle the fight where it feels almost as if you're just banging your head on the wall over and over again because it's the most important thing. Look, it might be hard for marketers and agency people to understand, but in a boardroom setting of even a very large company, if you say, look, I've got some research on this topic, do you want to see what consumers think? It is met with astonishment. Like someone's just invented the idea of research. And that's because we forget other parts of the organization don't have even that, you know, that muscle memory of doing research on consumers. Yeah. The reason most companies set their price badly is because it doesn't occur to them at any point in the process to do a little bit of simple research on what the price could be from the point of view of the people paying it. Instead, they look at their existing prices. They look at their, their retailers, they look at competition and they look at their costs none of which are as instructive as how much would you pay for this thing with some formal research? So, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's the job of marketers to make the case for marketing. And, and remember that one of the great truths of business is all you need to be in business is to have a product and have sales, right? They're the two essentials. We're the third wheel. But we have to make the case for that third wheel and why it makes products better and sales bigger if we can stop and say, no, hang on a minute, that's great, but let's talk to these customers and find out what they think of the product and what other products they consider and how much they'd like to pay. So you've almost got to make the case for it, even to a smart organization, before you then can do it. And like this big debate about getting investment from the C-suite for brand building, which goes on and on and on. The key message that comes out of CFOs is, you can't just turn up one day with a proposal for brand investment. You've built your reputation with me over five years and I trust you and I talk to you and you talk to me and we already have a relationship in place. That, that's the difference, right? We've already established that we respect each other. You can't turn up with a presentation, right? Are, are we already on those, on those terms, you know? And I think that's, again, that's not a common situation. And to even just simplify that, that's where the answers come from. That, you know, marketing can be complex at times or it can be hard, but I, I've found that that's because we don't have the right answers. We haven't talked to the right people yeah. or enough people within the category, or if so, we haven't asked the right questions to understand how that's to orient absolutely. yourself and where to go. That's absolutely true. And, and another clue is always complexity, right? So if you ever meet a client or a marketing director that has a very complex strategy, you know, I, and my definition of complexity is more than a page, you know, it means that it's not very good. Yeah. And, and what you learn with, I've worked with a few great marketing directors and CMOs over the years, and they have this very simple, commonsensical plan. And if you're close to them, you'll say to them, yeah, but why don't we do X instead of Y? And just for a minute, when there's no one around, they'll open their kimono and reveal, you know, 400 layers of complexity and take you through and go, that's why we're not doing that. And you go, okay, get it. So what, what the marketer's job is, 
is to create and craft a strategy that's simple using very advanced, complex thinking. Yeah. And, and again, a sure sign of a bad strategy is that it's complicated. And that, that the greatest compliment in, in brand strategy, at least, is that your team go, okay, well, we get it. It's pretty obvious. And you go, yeah, yeah sure. It's super obvious. Go and do it. Go and do it. Yeah. Whereas like your, uh, your appendix is the strongest thing that you have, but you only look at it when you're, when you're being, being you tested. It. Well, we just talked about it in mini MBA, right? The greatest gift you've got when you do your marketing plan is a hyperlink. And I'm serious, right? Because what you've got, you know, every marketing plan that's presented is too long. So what happened? I've done literally 2000 marketing plans. So I've sat through them, I've reviewed them, I've presented them, you know, I'm, I've officially done enough. So what happens with almost all of them is they go too long because they've got like, you know, 20 slides, right? And there's an, always an hour to present, 80 minutes if you're lucky. So what happens is they get halfway through with loads of questions and we aren't anywhere near the plan. And they go, oh, I'm out of time. So let me just jump to the final slide here, blah, 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 blah. Right? That's not the way to do it. You need less in your marketing plan because again, you've already simplified it. But to your point, when the big airy question comes up about, but why are you targeting the, the alphas? You click your little hyperlink button and you go, here we go. Because you see that over there, they're this and they're that, and we'll never do that. And you click it and it comes back to your deck. And after having sat in that room and been through that with good marketers, where they metaphorically slap you across the face two or three times, you stop asking those questions, not because you're not, not interested in the answers, but because you know this marketer's got it, that she's on top of it. And you can basically sit back because what she's going to do is humiliate you if you ask any more questions. And the point of this brand plan is she's got it and let her go. You know what I mean? That, that's what you want. The simplicity, as you say, with that appendix, which is imminently hyperlinkable, demonstrating depth and complexity of thought. But man, that doesn't happen very often. That doesn't happen very often at all. Yeah, working like a lawyer, where it almost seems too good as the words come out, but then you have the briefcase ready. Being unimpeachable. Um, yeah. But you don't have to show all of it. Wear it all on your sleeve there. Keep it simple. And to the folks that you're talking to, whether that's your creatives internally or, or selling yeah. the strategy to you, you, and you need you need that simplicity of language as well, right? We often have, you know, all this complexity gets thrown in. It's not necessary. You know what I mean? If you really understand your, your field, we could use simple language for the most part. There's a couple of words we need that are really are different. You know, you get a lot of pushback on distinctiveness and differentiation. It's like, no, no, they, they really do mean different things. They, you know, you have to accept that. If there was any way you could live without one of them, I'd live without them, but you can't, right? But you boil it down as much as you can to the core concepts. So you you talked about how you've done, you know, hundreds, thousands of of strategies and, and oftentimes those those plannings happen on that that yearly cycle. Um and we've talked a lot, a lot of different concepts, but um one being that, you know, a lot of the work that goes out is only going to be going out for potentially a year, or at least that's how the the creative awards are are measuring it. And do you think that that yearly cycle is dictated by the awards and and hurting the ability for for work to go out and have that long term exposure of the work well, that's it, necessary? Or it's partly that, but. I mean, I'm a fan of annual plans, right? I, I, so first of all, I like, I like, you know, we all dance to the rhythm of the finance team. So you plan, you should be planning your year on the financial year of your company. A little bit of agility is a great thing, but it shouldn't turn into quarterly planning. It's bullshit, right? And I think when you set an annual plan with long and short-term objectives, there's also in the back of your mind, the knowledge that the long objectives are probably going to go into years two, three, four, five. It's just that we're going to eat the elephant one year at a time, see where we are. You know, the problem with a three-year plan, if you've ever seen one, is year one, they spend a lot of time on it. And years two and three is just extrapolation, right? It's just bullshit. So planning yearly increments is definitely one of the key lessons. But from a creative advertising point of view, there's often no reason we need to change even the execution, but certainly not the overall campaign idea from year to year. The more and more data that's coming out is clearly telling us that 
you you absolutely just want to maintain the same campaign and the the impatience of the client and the agency to change things is at their detriment um four out of five new campaigns aren't as good as the old campaign they replace we are now are pretty sure there's no such thing as wear out consumers don't pay that much attention to campaigns so the reality is the the client's getting itchy but you could probably go forever with the same winning campaign. And I spoke to, to the team at System One, John and his team at System One, who do amazing uh, uh, creative tracking. And their point was for about 10,000 bucks, they can pre-test any new ad campaign and compare it to your old ad campaign. And he was saying, yeah, three, four out of five of those new ads aren't testing as well. But when he tells... The client team and the agency, you know, we can save you $3 million here. Don't run the new campaign. Just keep your old one running. It's met not with, thank God for that, you've saved us. It's met with disappointment because they just want to create something new. That, that They think that's their job, right, to make new ads. Um, and so I think, yeah, there's a terrible, uh, the pornography of new change Newness is is a very big problem in the industry. We keep changing slogans, we keep changing logos, and we keep changing ads that we don't need to change because most of the market still haven't noticed them. So yeah, there's there's a huge part. So I love an annual planning cycle, but I don't see that ads need to change year in, year out. And awards should literally not be on anyone's agenda, inside or outside the agency. Again, the System 1 guys have got really good data showing if you take all the can lions that were won last year in the US and UK, the proportion of them that are excellent at brand building is almost exactly the same as the general proportion of ads in the US and the UK. They, they, there's, there's no value. I mean, there's an internal value in winning a creative award. It signifies absolutely nothing in terms of effectiveness. Yeah, so you can see how like the creative shops, that's that's the end goal because that's the value that that they yeah. provide. But for for a brand manager or a strategic partner, it's the the game is is effectiveness. And I know we've gone through a lot and we've we've begun to un unravel um the craziness that's going on, but you're doing that yourself. You have the mini MBA in in marketing, um, in brand management and and now management where you have, at least as I've gone through the, the marketing portion of it, um, you know, you've packaged it up into three, three core pieces, your diagnosis, your strategy and planning as, as your basics. Um, and if you can get really good in, in those basics, there's, there's hope for the U S and other markets to, to, to sort that out, which, which you agree. Yeah, look, I I had, I've had a lot of debates over the years about this, you know, again, that the, there's a lot of morons in marketing that are proud of not having a training in marketing. And I find that distasteful. I mean, literal Philistines, right? And they always give you some bullshit metaphor for why not being qualified in marketing makes them sharper or better. Or, you know, there's some moron years ago telling me that kids who come straight out of high school into the MBA can do that if they have natural talent. And I'm like, dude, I have no idea what you're talking about. Here's the thing. Training in marketing makes you better at marketing. Shut the fuck up. Do you know what I mean? Like being proud of not being trained in the thing you do is makes you look like an idiot. I don't even know what the hell you're talking about with the NBA. Do you know what I mean? And and that's that's another battle we have to fight, which is, okay, not everyone can afford four years in college, and that may not be the best way to learn marketing. But a little bit of training, um, either from your employer anywhere from a reputable source is going to make you better at the game, right? If the training is, is, is at all good, this is not, you know, marketing is not common sense and it's not creativity. That's neither of those things are really what marketing is. So once you understand the basics, it also isn't rocket science. You know what I mean? It isn't super hard. If you get your ducks in the right, in the right uh, rows, things suddenly make a lot more sense. And, uh, you know, my experience with mini MBA is you take quite experienced marketers, you give them a proper training and it, it isn't my, you know, it's the stuff, it's a hundred years of marketing training. You know, it's not my, the, the 2% of it is me. 98% of it is someone else's ideas in marketing that, that have been proven out. 
and you give it to a decent marketer and they go, the, the most common response we get is, I wish I'd done this 10 years ago. Because now I know my shit. I know what I knew. I know what I don't know. I know what the names of everything is. I know how to do it. It's filled in these gaps. I wish I'd done this 10 years ago. And, and that's, that's a wonderful bit of feedback, but it's also rather sad because you get, a, you get a sense of the lack of confidence that's afflicted these marketers until now. And then they go, oh, it's not that difficult. This is what this means. You know what I mean? So yeah, it's a great pleasure doing it. Um, beyond the financial benefits of it, it's, I, I used to have it with clients. So I'd take a client through a market. We'd work on a big project and we'd do it and it would work, you know. And they'd sort of come back to you and go, this is working. And I'm like, first of all, yes. But second, what, what, what did you think we were doing here? Just fucking about, you know what I mean? Like, yes, this works. Yes, this is going to make you more money. That's why we're doing this. And they clearly never seen it before, right? And it's the same with mini MBA. They go, oh, hang on. This all now makes sense. And I'm like, yeah, it really does make sense. It's not an enigma. Go and do it. And they're like, yeah, I will. And so that that's a, it is a great pleasure, right? It is a great pleasure watching that happen for so many marketers. You know, we train six, 7,000 a year. So it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. And it's, it's been awesome. Awesome taking it. It's been an incredible course. And Mark, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to unravel the craziness of, of uh, our industry. It's a, a joy for me getting to, to talk to you about it because um, I love it similarly um, and hope to have you on again soon. Anytime, man. And given you've got Bill Murray, you can't see this on the podcast, but you've got a big poster of Bill Murray, Chicago's finest. I mean, he's a Canadian, but Chicago resident. We should end with Bill Murray's great quote, which you may know, which is, Everybody keeps going on about being rich and famous. They should try just being rich first. 